Aloha, my Kako, and mahalo for joining us today on the Moana Nui podcast. We appreciate you as viewers of the live podcast, as well as those who catch later recordings, and of course, Papa Ola Lokahi, in whom we share partnership with for content connecting Hawaii to the diaspora. Today's show, we are in for a treat as we get to talk story with two Manavahine who were students of Dr. Trask. The late Honani K. Trask, for those who may not know who she is, was a fierce advocate for the self-determination of Kanaka Maole. She was a poet and educator, was part of the working group for the crafting of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a film director, and held many hats in the act of resistance against colonial constructs. Upon her departure to the realm of the ancestors, she is remembered by those who love her and by those who hold on to her words, her ideas, and her legacy. Talking story with us today is Dr. Noelani Goodyear Kaupua and Dr. Aaron Kahunavai Kaala Wright. We are very excited to have these two join us today. Raised on the lands of Oahu, Noelani Goodyear Kaupua is a Kanaka Male who works as a professor of Hawaiian and Indigenous politics at the University of Hawaii Manoa. She believes in the power of Ea, the living, breathing, rising of her her sovereign people, because she hears and feels it in their stories or our stories. Noi was raised by the Ko'olau Mountains and Kaneohe Bay and strengthened by the current of Ka'ivi. Her popo taught her how to play horseshoes, to share mangoes from her tree with anyone who asks, and to treat youth with genuine respect and adoration. Noi tries to bring this kind of love to her writing, teaching, and leadership roles. Her commitment to Native Hawaiian education is evidenced in her dedication to public education and in her work as a board member of the Kamehameha Schools, Kane Hunamoku Voyaging Academy, and Ma'o Organic Farms. In author and editor, Noelani's books and articles address Hawaiian movements and Indigenous education. More information about her publications can be found at www.noegoodyearkaupua.info. If you followed the events on Mauna Kea in 2019, Noi was one of eight who protested on the Mauna Kea Access Road by tying themselves to a category. I say this to not only say Noi teaches Hawaiian politics, self-determination, and decolonialism, but that her words matches her actions. Mahalo Noi for joining us today. Aloha. Mahalo Nui for having us, Pauahi. Yes, of course. Erin Kahunavai Ka'ala Wright is Kanaka OEV Hawaii, or Native Hawaiian, and a fifth-generation Kama'aina of Kalua Opalena Kalihi O'ahu. Raised on the lands of her mother's family and during, doing her best to raise the sixth generation on their Kula EV. For nearly 20 years, Kahunavai was a student affairs scholar practitioner supporting Kanaka and other indigenous folks to and through higher education before transitioning her current role as an associate professor of educational administration in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. The research she pursues connects her commitment to Ea Hawaii with the transformative potential of higher education for fellow Kanaka and Pacifica folks toward Kuliana Lahui, or Native Nation Building. Some of Kuhunavai's work includes Ka Ikena Aka Hawaii towards a Kanaka Oivi critical race theory. Welcome, Kuhunavai, and mahalo for joining us as well. Mahalo, Pauahi. Together, both Noi and Kuhunavai continue to collaborate on bringing content with work such as a special edition of Hu Lili, a multidisciplinary research on Native Hawaiian well-being, and a biography of Haunani K. Trask. Again, we express our gratitude for your presence today and virtually as we engage with the legacy of Dr. Haunani K. Trask. So let's get in to the discussion for today. Before we moved on, move on, I just want to ask, is there anything that either of you want to add to your intros that maybe I didn't have a chance to say that you may want to highlight? No. Okay. No. Thank you so okay. much. <laughs> All right. So let's revisit the life of Dr. Haunani K. Trask. So to start, This is either for either of you or both of you can answer. Any questions that we ask, both of you can answer. It doesn't really matter. I I sent the question, so you should both be able to speak to any of these. We may not go in the order that the questions are presented to you. So just a heads up. 
But to start, what are three words that you would associate with Dr. Trask and no explanation? Three words for the audience to just hold on to. I was thinking fierce, brilliant, and generous. In addition, because I agree 100% with those three words, I would say kuge, kuleana, visionary. Amazing. Okay, so audience, hold on to those words. There are a good amount of Kanaka outside of Hawaii who love Haunanike Trask. But what can be said about her to those who are not aware of her? And this question comes as a personal question because I did not know who Trask was until I was well in my 20s, right? So because I lived in the diaspora, I I think it was like one of my professors who was like, oh, have you ever read Hanani K. Trask? And I was like, oh, no, I never heard of her. So then I read some of her works and continue to read her works to this day. So what, what would you want people to know about her who may not know her? Kono, you want to go first? No, but I will. <laughs> Take turns. <laughs> Sorry, but both of us, we, we're always like trying to give each other the first, anyway, yeah. the first chance. I guess for me, I would say for folks who don't really know much about her, her public persona, I think, is, is contrasted with like more of her personal persona. I think because Noi and I knew her, just as a, she's our our kumu definitely, but just also as a person, she is one of the, and maybe this comes through on some of her public, her public speeches, but she's one of the funniest people you're ever going to meet. Her wit is so incredibly quick. And I think that's, you can see that a little when she's bantering back and forth with certain interviewers, but she's, she's so funny and she's so kind, like I was saying, and generous with her time and her words and her encouragement. And I think that for me, for me personally, that's an important part of her. I know that I would love for people to know, in addition to all of the things that people see publicly, her fierceness, her dynamic sort of oratory, all of those other more robust, colorful attributes that people often associate with her. Yeah. So just to add, I think about the first time I became aware of who she was. Kahuna Bai and I were her students in Hawaiian studies in the early and mid 90s early to mid 90s but she was at least in Hawaii a very prominent figure in the Hawaiian movement from the 80s onward and I think the media really loved featuring her because she was so dramatic part of her training as literally as a a dramatist when she was an actor when she was younger but she also comes from this family of amazing political orators And so she was just the most amazing speaker. And she was really featured also in the media because she spoke so fearlessly about the harms that tourism and military and just like ignorant settlers in Hawaii were doing to Kanaka. And because she spoke so fearlessly, people either loved her or they detested her and that's what happens when you speak we just were at this event that was hosted by the Pa'i Foundation and Kalahui Hawaii that was honoring her and just this past Saturday <laughs> and one of the things that Kumu Kawai Kapu Hewitt was talking about was how Waha Mama Oya Ka'i Puka she was she opened the door she opened the door for people to for Kanaka to question that we are that we are not American, as she said in 1993. And then also because she spoke so powerfully about the truth, that means sometimes you're not as popular, right? And so anyway, there, but she was so popular <laughs> in so many ways. Yeah, she's a poet, a teacher, a fierce leader, just all, so many things, so many things. I love to show when I'm guest lecturing for the students that I lecture for, I love to show the clippings of her. And this two two Thursdays ago, we I shared with my social justice class that I TA for that exact piece where she says we are not American. And so I'm reading all of their assignments now. And some of them are like really, really hung on to that. And so yeah, I think I think she is for every generation. And sometimes, like you said, speaking truth to power 
or truth against power is what I think she often did isn't always popular, but I think we're at a time where some of these things are popular for those who want to listen, right? So referencing that, her speech on January 17th, 1993, that you just alluded to, Noi, that so powerfully objected to American identity for Kanakamale is one that we see in rotation on social media. Did her idea ever waver from this notion? And if so, how? And if not, why do you think this is? Never wavered. I think for context, it's helpful to understand that she is of, within her own family and within the Lahui Hawaii, she's of the second generation to live their whole life under U.S. occupation. So her parents were the very first generation to live their entire lives under U.S. occupation. Her grandmother remembered when Lili was overthrown and passed that story down to her mom and her mom passed that story down onto her. So it's not that far away. I think when we were younger as her students, we would think like, oh, a hundred years ago, that seems so long, 1893. That's like ages ago. But now that we're like a half a century old ourselves, we realize that, wow, that it really wasn't that long. So her kupuna were on the, signed the kuei petitions. They were very aware that within, and then within that, their family, they carried those stories. And so her and her siblings, they were, they were all taught from growing up that Hawaiians had our own country and we're very capable of governing ourselves and running sustainable society in our islands, providing for all the needs of all the people um, without any foreign ships, without any help from anybody else for the vast majority of our existence. And so she carried that very deeply. She never, ever, never, ever wavered from that manal. How about... What are some of her foundational works that you would recommend? Oh, actually, let's go back. Let's go back before we go to this. For the people who do know who she is, if they've read her works, they may know this, that she actually went to college on the continent. So in some of her work, she speaks about her experiences in the diaspora. Can you speak to how the diaspora shaped her ideas and thoughts? Yeah. Kona, what you want to take that? first or you want no you that was your part so okay <laughs> sorry well boy you can just tell us two of your like you te- you speak first and then you okay like, <laughs> you want to avoid the awkward silence <laughs> the polite, oh, you go first oh, you go first yeah so kumo honani ke was she graduated in 1967 so if you can imagine that time this is like the vietnam war era some of her classmates are being drafted and sent off to war. She herself started off at Drake University, didn't like it there, went to Chicago, experienced tremendous racism there, and then transferred to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where she ended up getting all of her degrees. Not to say that she didn't, she definitely experienced racism in Madison as well, but What she arrived at when she got to Madison was almost upon arrival, what was happening there was massive student uprising, and in particular, a Black student-led strike. There had been on another campus in the University of Wisconsin system an incident where every single Black student was expelled for protesting the war. And standing up for calling for Black studies. And so she arrived at this like amazing moment of student organizing. There was the Black student-led strike. There was a TA strike. So graduate student teaching assistants, organizing to have their labor recognized and their right to collectively bargain. And then she became really involved as well as supporting those movements and involved in anti-war protests. She became really involved in the radical feminist movement and was very pivotal in the efforts to create 
women's studies and feminist studies courses in the university's curriculum, particularly in her department, political science, but she worked with people across all departments. It was 10 years, uh, roughly, that she was in Madison. So that was a, a significant and formative part of her life while she was away. Her sister, also Mili Lani Trask of Kalahui, Hawaii fame, was also away, but on the West Coast. And their exposure to these anti-imperialist, anti-racist movements were really formative in shaping them. And also for them seeing how, and for Kumahonanike in particular, seeing how universities could be more than bastions of white supremacy and and settler colonial power. Like, how could we capture some of that space and energy for a much broader swath of people? Kahuna Vai, did you want to add anything? No, I think Noi captured it perfectly. I think the only thing maybe that I wanted to emphasize is that her time at Madison really brought to the fore the use of Black, the Black Power movement as just really inspirational and formational to her later political analysis. And so as students, we used to get those kinds of readings in her classes as well. So that, to me, that's an important thread through her work how that lasted, I think, throughout her lifetime. So I feel like that's an important part too. Yeah, and I really can relate to these sentiments. And I think for many Kanaka in the diaspora, especially in the 80s, right? Like we weren't, we we were out here, but we weren't out here at the rates that we are now. My father joined the military at some point in the 80s. And I remember leaving and pretty much my whole life grew up around the Black community or the African-American community, right? And so this was the community that like really took me in. And so there's similarities between Hawaiian systems of families and like how Black families like relate to their children as well too. So yeah, it was it's a very interesting dynamic. I'm not going to say this is for all Kanaka in the diaspora, but I know that there are many in the diaspora who hang on to these other methods of what family looks like, right? And embraces those families, but also the movements, right? So like, for example, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, right? In 2020, at the height of Breonna Taylor. So understanding all of the stuff I had learned in my Pan-African Studies class or my African-American Studies classes through my undergrad programs and really holding on to that identity. But knowing that at some point in my 20s, I was like, okay, wait, why do I know so much Black history, but then I don't even know my own history, right? And so it was that importance of like knowing about the civil rights movements and knowing about the Black Panthers and so many other movements that were going on that were carrying with the Black Panthers um, and being like, okay, wait, we, we were there too, right? So yeah, it's, it's very interesting to hear that she was connected in the same way to these kind of movements, when she was in the diaspora. So this leads me to the, the question that I was going to ask next. And we'll ask Hunabai to go first. So some of her works, she speaks about her experiences in the diaspora. Can you speak to how the diaspora shaped her ideas and thoughts? I think, Noi, I both spoke a bit to, to this. I think being away for her, and she would tell us this as students too, where when you're away from, she would call Hawaii the colony, right? When you're away from the colony, the politics of colonization become a lot more, I think, in relief, right? You can see them more, they're highlighted more, as opposed to when you're living in the colony. It looks very different when you're going through, living through the day-to-day of colonialism mm-hmm. and occupation. So I feel like her being away provided her with a bit of distance so that she could look at Hawaii as this unit of analysis. And then with the influence of the Black Power movement, with the American Indian movement, all of those different other movements that she was involved with, I think really informed the way that she started to see Hawaii. And you can see that in her early, from the time she was started writing and publishing, you can see all of those influences in her work. I think one of the other important things that being away for, being away, I think helped to do in addition was now I'm getting sorry, my 
my kid is texting me on the side. So I apologize for that. So I'm looking at that and looking at you folks. I'm going to put him on mute. Hold on. And I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. I don't know. Noe, did you want to say anything else about how her being away influenced her? Uh, yeah. I, well, I was going to say that I think where where she was in Madison was was there were these movements, but predominantly it was white. It was like 95% white, the student body at that time. So she went from being at a school, Kamehameha, which was all Hawaiian, to being in a school where it was all white. <laughs> and not all white, again, 95%. She was treated as an exotic. She's beautiful. If you've seen photos of her, that photo um, is from 1993. So when she arrives in Madison in the 70s, she's just gorgeous. We looked at photos of her and some of her friends and it'd be like, all these people and then her, bam, like she's just glowing. So she stood out. And when we went to go do interviews of folks there, the word that came up over and over again from her and these are fe- folks who are either her teachers or friends was they call called her exotic and so i think on one hand that really alerted her to the way that many people in the u.s see hawaii and hawaiians so that was always an important part of her critique through her later work yeah the way that hawaii gets feminized and is exoticized but I think the other thing that we heard from folks when we interviewed them about her life there was that she was never like a shrinking violet. She was never one who was shamed to speak up. And I think that actually comes from her family and her her training before she got there. But she was like was ready to go toe to toe with professors, white male professors in her in her classes as a grad student. She was organizing alongside grad students and faculty when she was an upper division undergrad and later. And I think one of the things that this strengthened for her was that when she did come home and she was negotiating with on behalf of the PKO with the US Navy official, high ranking officials and doing like politics from the grassroots but speaking to state folks like she just never was scared and I don't I think part of that was probably always in her always in her personality but I think being away and having to really fight for the space to speak and fight against being just like marginalized and pigeonholed as this like beautiful exotic brown woman it sharpened her blade even more yeah that was something i I, yeah no when you were talking about that i forgot about how everyone we interviewed that was the first thing they would say was like she was stunning she was exotic and then they would be oh and then we would be wowed by how smart she was and i know that kind of threw i know it threw me off a little bit and i can imagine again like more was saying right in the sea of whiteness there's this beautiful woman who also has this immense brilliance coming to the fore and you're just like blown away. Even her her doctoral advisor, her dissertation advisor said the same thing. Is like she stood out in class because she was so beautiful mm. and, and brilliant and brilliant. Like this. Yeah, that's amazing. That idea of exotic now, I don't think holds a crab in a barrel, basically, meaning like it's such a not good word and can also be seen mm-hmm. as like, racist exotic right again like some of these sentiments from research that i've done as well as my experiences the same thing right called being called exotic and how what that what that kind of does to kanaka and the diaspora who hear these kind of subjectifications of like what people think about us right Mm -hmm. so okay Go ahead. I was going to start. I was just no, going to no, go ahead. I think that also definitely impacted her relationship with feminism. You can see that definite that changing from the time she was at Madison to the time she came home, where her views on feminism just really shifted, given her I think positionality. And I think I I don't remember who said it. Maybe no, you said it on the Saturday event. I had referenced folks were saying she was talking about intersectionalism before before a lot of folks were talking about intersectionality I should say intersectionality 
So I think that's one of the things being away did for her as well is to show that even more. Yeah. And so thinking about, so that for those of you who may not know what the Saturday event was, there was an event that was in honor of Hanani K. Trask. And there was some poetry readings that had happened there. And correct me if I'm wrong, just some words of affirmations and expl- explanations of who she was. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So this, yeah. Go ahead, Noi. You can speak to that. I was going to say, and many of us were her former students, revoice revoicing or giving voice to her her poetry so that's what happened this past saturday is what they're referencing when you hear them say the event on saturday and then i know kahunavai just brought up intersectionality which is an amazing term for those of you who are not really who may not know where that term comes from it comes from kimberly crenshaw who is a Black lawyer and activist. And it actually stems from a case with the General Motors, uh, the General Motors company. And yeah, so there's some history there that is interesting to learn about. So if you don't know anything about Kimberly Crenshaw or the connections to how this term intersectionality came through, that is another person to really look to. So I want to talk about feminism because this is something that I'm really interested in myself. Dr. Trask wrote Eros and Power, The Promise of Feminist Theory, and then would later go on to write about how she does not subscribe to this idea fully anymore. And so Kahuna Vai just alluded to this. What was her relationship with feminism and the ways this framework changed her, changed for her throughout her, throughout her career and throughout her? Kahuna Vai, do you want to start? And then we'll go with Noi. I would say, I don't know if I can elaborate more on that. Other than to say that I feel because she w- when she was away and she was exposed to all these different scholars, and not that she didn't have a sense of what being a wahine meant and a Hawaiian, Hawaiian wahine, I think it just became, again, like when I was saying, more sharpened what, through her experiences and through her exposure to the civil rights movement, to the feminist movement, and to being surrounded by white feminists at, at Madison, frankly. She fought very hard to establish women's studies there. She supported a faculty member who was a feminist who didn't get tenure promotion. And so I feel like, again, her lived experience was influenced by that. I would, I'm going to do the yikes thing and toss it to Noi because she was tasked with reading and analyzing Arrows and Power for her part of her (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like Kahuna Bai said, she was really influenced in those years of grad school by Radical feminists who were talking about how different aspects of one's identity came together, class, race, gender. But as I mentioned before, like a lot of the folks who were part of that feminist organizing in Madison were were white feminists. Not to say that there weren't women of color feminists, but the people were predominantly organizing with the, the particular group that was trying to move women's studies forward, were predominantly white. So she experienced some rub and tension already there. And with with her book, I think one of the things that she criticizes is a lot of the kind of criticism that was coming out with early feminist theory was like how the gender divisions of labor, like women are supposed to do this in the home and men are supposed to be out in the public world was... I think it gave her a language to talk about patriarchy in ways that she always knew and saw in her own family, in her own Hawaii, in her own life. But as theory does, it gives us new language to talk about about those things. So she just experienced that in such an embodied way there. And then also when she got home, right, she was involved with Hawaiian movement organizing in Hawaii around Kaho'olawe. And so one of the first pieces that she publishes after coming home is this article on that she calls the double colonization of Hawaiian women. And she talks about her view as a Native Hawaiian feminist, where she's also critiquing how patriarchy operates within our own movements and how that was limiting for for women who were not fitting neatly into the acceptable categories for for women and even in leadership. So it was it was a struggle and a fight to get her and other women in 
to leadership positions, which she and, and others did. But then she also began organizing with feminists on the U8 campus too. Again, at that time, campus feminists, mostly white. And there was this sense that you had to choose. You have to choose between your people and what we stand for thing. And so she always chose her people first, which isn't to say, though, that she ever gave up an analysis of gender or how colonialism's occupation, militarization, all those things operate through gender hierarchies and gender violence. She was always very, very attuned to that. She was very much a, a pragmatic person as far as like her organizing. She wanted to not ever be stuck in, okay, I'm going to use the language that's like of cachet in academy at a particular moment. She wanted to make sure that what she was doing was legible, understandable to and effective with her people. And I think at some point she found that the label feminist was not something that was going to be, I don't know, effective in, in terms of organizing with Kanaka. But like I said, she never gave up that kind of analysis. And there were lots of other women of color at, in that, at that time period when she makes that choice not to identify as a feminist who also had a very contentious relationship with that term feminism doesn't mean that they didn't agree with critiques of patriarchy or with the absolute necessity of empowering women and disrupting a gender binary and all those things. But it was a different kind of time than it is now where like indigenous feminisms is a much more widespread kind of, there's more of a community there. I think at that time she didn't really have a community of Hawaiian feminists to be able to identify in that way. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying about Indigenous feminisms. My first year, I took an Indigenous feminism course with my, one of my supervisors right now, and she says to me, I should have I should have threw some Trask in there. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. So since you're talking about some of her writings, what would be some of her foundational works that you would recommend for those who are just now being introduced to her? Why do you think these works are important for Kanaka and maybe even Kanaka for just to review over again, right? Maybe they haven't read the work in like 15 years and maybe it's just important at this time to read it again. Why are these works important for Kanaka and who have never lived on the Aina to read it? We'll start with Noi and then Kahunabai. Yeah, one of the things that Kahunavai and I found was even though we were her students and we thought we knew a lot of her work, is that as we really dug into this project, we're like, wow, she's just more and more. We found more and more and more things that we hadn't even been aware of prior to starting the biography project. So I think first and foremost, From a Native Daughter, that's the collection of essays that came out in 1993, first edition, and then revised edition in 99. But still, if you read it today, like it is so relevant for this political moment. Also shows how she was not just a Hawaiian nationalist who centered Hawaii. She always saw Hawaii in the context of a larger, as Heoli Osorio would say, upena of anti-imperialist struggle. So that book start, actually starts off after the introduction with Pacific Islands, like our place in the Pacific. And she was very clear about situating us within our context of Kamoana Nui, not just thinking of Hawaii in relation to the U.S., but mm. in that larger family who are connected culturally and also connected through our political struggles against foreign particularly European and American powers that sought to take our lands and subdue us. So that that book, I think, is super important, and it's also really accessible. Her voice comes through so strongly in that book. I think the double colonization article that I mentioned is really important because even though she did give up the label of feminist, I think many of the critiques that she makes in there are useful for us for the kind of like self-reflection about our own movements that are that are important. And I know when I teach it till today, the young wahine in my classes always really, really love and appreciate that 
article because it helps give them language, as I was talking about earlier, for things that they're experiencing already all the time. And then her poetry is, if you if you enjoy poetry, she has two books of poetry that just give you a different sense of other sides of her, both that like really fierce political side and, and also all the love that is the foundation of why she's as fierce. I think that's everything that I would recommend definitely for the starter. I think as the part of the team that likes to read reports, I would say if folks are up for it, I would have them read the Native Hawaiian Study Commission final report that she worked, that she wrote. Because I, I think it gives folks just another perspective of her work where, as Noe says, she calls it pragmatic and she wants her work to be legible. Those are great descriptors of how I think she moved. She wasn't just a person who could create and talk about theory. She was someone who put that theory into action. And her report writing, as boring as some people might see it, really can show how you take what you're thinking about and put it into actual action to make material changes in the lives of Kanaka people. So the Native Hawaiian Study Commission report, I would also say the Ka'u report from 1986, which she wrote as like, a, well, she contributed to writing it and she was part of the, the task force. And it was the blueprint for Hawaiian everything throughout the University of Hawaii system, which is where the majority of Hawaiians participate in higher ed. Those works, I feel, are, again, provides insight into the ways in which she made the practice part of theory happen. And for me, as a person who does education, that's like super important is the, the theory gives us language. The theory helps us to make connections. The, the theory helps us to make sense of our world. But for me, without how do we implement that, right? Where does the practice piece comes in? come in? I think is where, oh, there it is. I think that's where it's also very important, right? That's what to me makes her an outstanding scholar and leader is because she didn't just, it's like Noi, she did like how you introduced her. She doesn't just talk about things. She actually helped to make change. And I, I feel like that part of her life doesn't get the kind of accolades that her scholarly work does, the impact that she's had on Hawaiians, just again, everyday Hawaiians. Hawaiians who just called her on the phone because she would have her uh, her number, her home number, published in the phone book, who would just call her and she would talk story with them. To students like us who would be in her classes, who she would take time to talk story with. I think those are all of the things that make her an amazing Hawaiian leader. Yeah, not just, just, not just her brilliant written work, which has remained consistent for like 30-something years. And again, like what Nora was saying, right, is relevant after all this time, like, I think that was one of the, I don't know why it was so surprising, but Noi and I, we would reread all of her work and just text each other or call each other and be, be like, how is this still relevant? Or like, I missed this thing that she wrote. And it, it just describes to a T what is happening with our people right now. And she wrote this in before the 90s, even and her work from the 1980s. And I think one other body of, it's not really her well, it is her writing and it, it is in her writing, but it's the transcriptions of her speeches. So she has like, for example, I was reading on a trip recently, her Ho'oku'oko'a speech from like 1985. And just reading that was so many gems. And Namakoka Aina, and we want to give them props because they've helped us so much. Joan Manders helped us so much with getting these transcripts, allowing us to watch her videos. But you can order the transcripts from them and you can read all of the speeches that they have on file. So 93 from Ho'oku Oko'a, like all of those different speeches that she has, I think is another really great way to get to know how many K in a different way. Yeah, just to add one more thing to that, if you're more of a visual, like to watch videos and us reading the system, both through the Hamilton Library, it's like if you Google UA Voyager, it has a number of the First Friday episodes. So the other thing, this is, of course, before the internet, right? Before we all had smartphones, she led for many years. They called it First Friday, the unauthorized news. It was like a regular show where they would do news and analysis that wasn't covered by the mainstream media. So she was really 
interested in making sure that the kinds of things that she was studying and thinking about were accessible to anybody for free, not just people who were enrolled in the university. So all those First Friday episodes can be viewed either through the UH Manoa or through West Oahu has this film archive called Ulu Ulu, the Ulu Ulu Film Archive. Yeah, that that's when, that one. And you can also request episodes there. So oftentimes they would be her and her sister, Mili Lenny, who is in this photo, or it would be her and John Wittick, who was a labor organizer, or her and her partner, David Stannard. And from those, you get a sense of just the breadth of her knowledge. So there would be episodes where she's talking about a very specific kind of like thing that the city and county, the city council was doing that was going to impact lands or community folks in Hawaii. Or at this, And in the same episode, she would be talking about an issue like Palestine or something going on in some seemingly far place uh, in the world that she understood and helped people to see was was all connected in some way. Amazing. Mahalo for that. So I'm going to ask a couple of personal questions to you all in your relationship with Dr. Trask. Thinking about everything that you all had just spoke about in her readings, I think it's important to just reiterate what you all were saying. Dr. Trask has written about tourism, about militarization, about the academy, right? As Noi said, you can find all this stuff in From a Native Daughter. So if you're not familiar with that work, that is that is a pivotal point you can start with. And if you are familiar with that, then like Kahuna Bai said, there's other readings that perhaps we weren't aware of. I did not know anything about that. Ka'u of 1986. I'm excited to read that. But yeah, mahalo for sharing those works with us. So first, I'm going to give you, before I ask you, how has Dr. Trass impacted both of you? <laughs> Do you remember the first time you met Dr. Trask and what were your thoughts and feelings? And we'll start with Kahuna. So by the time I got to the university in the fall of 1991, she has been very prominent in the news media. So I grew up knowing who she was. And so I had a, like that kind of an impression of her, like, wow, she's just like so fierce. Honestly, it made me super uncomfortable because I have not been faced with a Hawaiian anybody actually Hawaiian anybody not just a woman just Hawaiian being so forceful and, and so just brilliant like that it was it was a little intimidating but the first time I met her in person was at Campus Center and I think it was 1992 she and Kumuliri Palaka and Nehiva had done a like a small forum on building the Hawaiian Studies building because it was a controversy the University of Hawaii was thinking of not building it anymore right so they were fighting very hard to keep the momentum going towards the building to getting it built and I sat like literally I had bought lunch and I saw them speaking I was like oh let me let me listen to what's going on and so I just like sat on the stairs at campus center and listened to what the, what they were talking about ate my lunch and then after I was they were so compelling especially Kumo Hamanike and I just went down like a dumb dumb head and I was like hey I would like to get involved because I love Hawaiian things and I'm a Hawaiian person. So I, what can I do to help? And they were so kind and gracious. And from, I think from what in the media, people would, like I said, I was intimidated, but after seeing them speak, I was like, they're looking for help. And so I went to just talk story with them and they really just pulled me in and it was like, thank you for wanting to help and come to this like meeting. And so it was a bunch of other students who, also felt compelled to get involved in this movement. And that was the first time that I met her. And I just thought, holy moly, like so amazing. Like the first time I she called my name, I was like, oh my God, she knows my name. It was like meeting like a rock star, but better. <laughs> it was like meeting a rock star. Like Kahuna Bay, I knew of her from the media before I actually met her. And so I was first, I, I had gone away for school. I was in LA and was not actually in Honolulu in January 1993 when the big march happens and she gives her famous, we are not American speech. And I was like, what the hell am I doing here? I need to go home. And there are 
people like her that I really need to learn from. So came back to UH, I majored in Hawaiian studies and fall of 19, no, I don't think it was, I think it was spring 94 that I first met her. But I was, remember going into her the class where her her class was scheduled for, and it was packed at that time. Everybody wanted to get into her class. So there were, it was standing room only. And let's, there's lots of noise. People are talking. And then she walks in the door to the front of the classroom opens in and she walks in and I'm like, Oh, she's way shorter than I thought she was going to be. I thought she was going to be like this because her personality was so huge. She was like five, two, but just the presence filled the room and a hush just fell over the entire room. And it was like that every time, every time she walked in, she just held that space in such a way. And I, so I remember every, many of her students have this story about how we get your first exam back and in red at the top, it's please see me. And I was so intimidated by her, even after having sat in her classes for several weeks and taking the exam and everything. Like I didn't go see her because I was like, no way. That's just way too scary. And then the next exam came and again, please see me underline. And she did that as a way to like cut through that huge crowd and have students come in and talk with her one-on-one and then encourage us. So she encouraged every single semester, every single class, she would encourage people, particularly Hawaiian women, but but others too, to think about grad school. And at that moment, you're like, grad school, what is that? So that was the kind of person that she was. And then she would spend a lot of time mentoring. So Kahunawai was part of a group called Kui Kalahiki that was very active when I was, when I had just come to, and they were involved in student leadership. They were involved in like voter registration and stuff. Kahunawai can share a, a lot more, but they, Kumuhonani K actively mentored outside of the classroom and actively made sure that her students were coming along with her to all of the things that she was doing. Did you want to elaborate a little bit, Kuhunawai, on what Noi just was talking about? No, well, I guess a little. I think the see me story is something that a handful of folks just thought. Like when we shared that story, I was like, oh my goodness, I wonder how many other people. And they, we end up finding so many other students, especially Wahine, like Noi was saying. Although I think, because I think only Kavika Tengan is the only man I knew who got <laughs> that. Every <laughs> other <laughs> Has been Wahine. So to me, that, and, and I think we all feel the same way, right? You get that from how they make trust, and everybody's like, hell no. I, initially, I thought I had <laughs> failed the exam. Yeah. And so I thought I had to go in, and I was like, I think, oh no. Yeah, her <laughs> class was we, the class that taught me to read everything and read well, because she also was great at like pointing out people. Like, I didn't think she knew who I was. So I would often like hide behind one of my classmates and friend Shane Palek. And we were all together and I would hide. And I remember when I went to see her after the see me, I'm like, no, I waited. I just waited to, until it was like, see me again, see me again. Or, oh, I better see because I don't want to make her mad either. <laughs> when I went to see her, it was the same thing where she's like, well, no, I know who you are. Because I was like, you know my name? She's like, yeah, you're the one hiding in the back. <laughs> and like, I know you have more to say in my class. And that's why I call on you because I know that you've read. I'm like, oh, thanks. But she was one of the, I think, the best storytellers. Like, she could really, again, hold an audience because she was so dramatic. It was like going to a show every twice a week. It was like, and then she would leave you, like, hanging, right? For the So when you come back to the next class, it was like, okay, we're going to pick up the show. She was an amazing, amazing kumu, just like an amazing kumu. And again, even when it came to her students, and I shouldn't say even when, because she really prioritized students when she was there, even with all of the different things that she was doing, right? Building a building, building a program, mentoring her junior faculty, creating positions for folks to be hired in the Center for Hawaiian Studies, providing it, leadership for Kalahui Hawaii, all these different things that she was involved in. She still made all of this time for students. So like, for example, when I was, when she had encouraged me to apply for graduate school, she like walked me through what graduate school even was because I had first generation college student like I had no idea what I was doing 
she walked me through graduate school. She said she would write letters of recommendation for me for school as well as for scholarships. I mean, she was that kind of mentor, like hands, very, very hands on. That's amazing. In my mind, I want to be like, you guys are so lucky. <laughs> that is, we are. We are. Yeah. We are. We are. So amazing. Yeah. So this question, do you think that there were times where she felt she was being taught by her students or by those she mentored? Or does she always feel like she was constantly teaching? That's a good question. I don't know that I don't know that we had a whole lot to teach her, but but maybe she was. She would always she treated us like equals in a way, you know, like interlocutors. It wasn't like she was just being didactic all the time, like I'm gonna tell you what to think. Like she was like, you need to be critically analyzing. You need to be able to think and speak for yourself. She wasn't, she wasn't a propagandist. Like she really wanted us to have independent thought. And mm-hmm. so I think this is just speculation, but I think maybe in the way that we were saying when she was in Madison in grad school, that she came toe to toe with professors. Like when she was a professor, she expected us also to mm-hmm. like, meet me here. I'm not here to just tell you what to think. Like, I want you to engage with me. Yeah, I feel the same way. She would ask us when I was part of that student organization, we would have her come to our meetings every once in a while to help us work through issues, right? Like, how do we analyze this issue? Or this is our analysis of the issue. Like, what is your feedback on our analysis? And she would always prioritize, okay, what are you folks thinking? Like, we would have to go first. Like, what do you think? And then she would tell us, Kate, this is what I'm thinking. So yeah, like I said, I don't know if we had a lot to teach her, but I think in some of the student, even when the student, more student focused issues, when it came to like some of the student government things that came up, or even some of the ways that we were participating in broader Hawaii movements, I think she just, I don't know if she learned from it, but I feel like she, she admired like the work that we, we decided to get involved with. She would have us over for dinner all the time to just like, in her way, like mahalo us. She would always say that she was so thankful to have just like students being involved and being interested and committing time and energy to being involved in not just not just things on campus, but things in our, our broader community that made her very, very happy. So I feel like I want to say that we provided her, I'm sure we stressed her out, but I want to <laughs> say that we also provided her with some joy, joy that she could share her wisdom with us and joy that like we did make I know for our little group like we did make her laugh all the time it was a bunch of just like funny things that people would say and just do and she would find just humor in in being with students and I and again I think from the number of times that she would have us over I'm sure David her partner maybe not so much enjoyed it (laughs) although he was always a gracious a very gracious host I think the times that she would invite us, like she invited us over all the time just to hang out and have dinner and just talk story, talk politics, but also talk pop culture. I think that's one of the other things that Noy and I loved about her is she knew a lot about, well, not a lot, a lot, but she knew a lot of some pop culture things that she enjoyed. Sometimes she didn't know the name of things, but she'd be like, oh yeah, I like that. So she was a fun, she was also a fun person to just be around with. Yeah. She loves Sudden Rush. Sudden oh, Rush. Yeah. Yeah. That was her favorite. Yeah. Um, yeah so good i'm glad that you touched on joy and peace in your words what do you think were some of trask's proudest moments where she found joy and peace i think i would really say her students when she saw us achieving when she saw us graduating she would always celebrate us or celebrate with us i think some of the examples is like she used to love or she loved a place called Ka- Kaimana. I don't even know what the real name of the place. Oh, how and I. Hello. And she would take us there to celebrate just different milestones that we've all reached. Like for me, graduating with my PhD, she took me there for dinner. She would take, uh, I, I was part of so many celebrations that she had for other students. I remember we went to Sam Choice fancy fine dining place when a friend of ours, like Joaquin Lau, graduated from law school. And I remember her just sitting there smiling, smiling at me and Lehua. And we're like eating our food. Like, what is she? She looks so creepy. <laughs> but she just like, like with all of her earnestness, just said like, I, I just am so proud of you. 
so proud of you for both of you for like going to grad school and finishing and just doing all these wonderful things. And that really Saturday night's event, as all of us went up and did our little ho'okupu for her, like that's what I felt like she was just probably just smiling from ear to ear with her glass of champagne, French champagne, right? There's no other kind of champagne. <laughs> like just smiling and like being so proud of all of us for our achievements, but also for just like not so much about her. Like she really, like people think, I, I think some of the perception is that like, oh, she's so about herself, but she really wasn't. She was one of the most generous people ever. Mm-hmm. So I think she would just be celebrating us and that she had a part in helping us achieve whatever it is that we wanted to achieve. But just seeing everybody on Saturday, like all of her former students and everybody's so amazing. Oh my goodness. I was just, weren't you blown away? And I was just like, oh my God. Yeah, oh my God. totally blown away. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree that she, especially that part that you were just saying, oh, no way about how she wasn't, like, she didn't seek the limelight for the limelight. Like, I think maybe now, because, like, certain videos get circulated about her, she becomes iconic, right? And then people only see, like, this individual woman up on the stage speaking unapologetically. And she really was always talking about the collective and the Lahui and that there's work to be done. And she really wasn't ever seeking personal glory. She would always talk about, we were sharing at this reminiscences on Saturday, like how even in classes, she would talk about her siblings and how one of her siblings was an immersion school teacher. One of her siblings or two of her siblings were attorneys. Two of her siblings were Fisher folks. And she would talk about how, Everybody has a place, like all the members of our Lahui have a place and that each person doesn't have to do everything. You just got to do your thing well, carry your kuleana, contribute to the collective, to the whole. And that's what the Lahui is. It's a nation of people of diverse strengths who are concerned about uplifting others in the in the Lahui. And so she was, she was totally like that. And we experienced it most from the position of her students. She was, she didn't like being, in fact, we had, I remember we had an event where we were like honoring her after her retirement, not her retirement party, but remember that one Kahunavai that was in downtown, like Chinatown? Yeah. 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 She just didn't want to be honored, like as an individual, she wanted the focus to be back on the analysis, the work to be done, the the collective. So seeing would say, our people in movement gives her gave her a lot of joy. Joy. Yeah. I was just gonna add, sorry, that one of the things that I think came out of that was like it's a joke, but not a joke. She would always say, right? No kalahui. So that became one of the things that we always said. Every time we had to do something that just also was like just hard or just oh, we didn't want to do it, we're tired. We'd all just be like shrugging our shoulders, no kalahui, no kalahui. And it became a joke. And it's carried on, I think, to this next generation. Like when I was at Native Hawaiian Student Services, we would we were a large unit getting supporting Native Hawaiian students going to and through higher ed. And every time like my staff folks would be like, Hey, let's let's do this thing or let's do this thing. And they'd be like, Oh, and about no kalahui. So it became like this thing now. Every time I do this, no kalahui, no, and that's from Holani K Trust. No kalahui, <laughs> right? because we always got to have our 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 eyes on the prize, which is for our lahui, right? Nation building mm-hmm. for the people, because she really she had so much of all the work. Even though people see her as someone who was divisive or whatever, everything she did was from aloha, and it was a deep aloha for our people. Yeah, how do you think that this would carry over for for Kanaka in the diaspora? Do you think that she would still consider like what our kuleana would be towards each other in the diaspora or what the Lahui looks like right outside of Hawaii? What kind of sentiments do you think she would have? I think absolutely. She saw, as she says in the beginnings of many of her speeches, that genealogy is paramount for us. So it wasn't like, where are you physically located? It was your connection to your genealogy. Do you remember your ancestors? Do you help out other members of the Lahui? Wherever you are, 
like those are the most central things. She was very much critical of like an individualistic American mindset and really always tried to focus us back on like how we're connected and how we help each other. And so I think she would be feeling the same way about anyone. It, I don't, it wasn't an issue that she talked about a lot, but what she did talk about a lot was the forces of displacement that exist in our islands today that force our people to become economic refugees from Hawaii. And she was fiercely critical of the kinds of touristic development, the kinds of foreign speculative investment, all the things that make it next to impossible for Kanaka to survive in Hawaii or make it really difficult. So she would always focus on those structural forces and critiquing those structural forces. And I never, ever experienced her like criticizing Kanaka for the the thing like not being Hawaiian enough. Like she would never like be like, oh, if, if you're not speaking our language, if you're not practicing this or that thing, what she would criticize you for and call you out for is if you were to sell out your people for personal gain. She would definitely criticize and call you out by name publicly, particularly people in positions of institutional power. But she would always, like I said, in reference to her siblings, like talk about how we got to have diverse strengths. Totally agree. I think if anything, she actually, I know from having been away for graduate school, Noi too, when we hosted her, she loved meeting Hawaiians. It didn't matter where or where, like where we were or where they were from. She just loved being around Hawaiians and she loved meeting Hawaiians and Hawaiians loved meeting her. We had her at UCLA. I remember and it was sm- I was like, oh, not too many people are going to show up. So we're going to have like a small, like open the coffee shop. And you would have thought like Bell Hooks was coming to talk. <laughs> there were like 300 people waiting, including the lead singer from Rage Against the Machine, who I didn't know that was him. And so we had to move the vet. We had to move, move it to another venue because there's so many folks. And so ma- there were so many Hawaiians that came from all over the place to see her. And she just, she was almost in tears, just like receiving May and receiving beautiful words and to me, that is really the essence of who she was. She just loved our Lahui so much that she really did dedicate every single it seemed, moment of her life. The more annoying I dig, the more refined, which is why I'm like, should we stop digging? Because <laughs> it just, seems, just doesn't stop. For a person who, it just seemed like she was doing everything and giving every minute of her life towards our Lahui. Like, I think that's one of the things maybe that people should understand too is really everything she did was for our people and for our collective betterment not just for her person, not just for her, not for her gain at all. Because she could have been a very famous and popular and mm-hmm. um, well-known uh, scholar just in and of herself, right? She didn't have to do any of the practice things that, for me, makes her an exceptional leader. But she didn't. She didn't. She took the criticism. She took the all of the hatred that people threw at her because she she really tried to protect a lot of other folks. So, yeah. So in when I hear those critiques of her, like, oh, she was about herself. I'm like, there's no way she was about herself. There is no way. With all of the things that she had to deal with as an individual Hawaiian, there's no way. Yeah, thank you for all of your sentiments. Now, I do have a question. Do you put on your students' papers, come see me in the office? (laughs) (laughs) Now they submit it via the classroom and stuff, you know, so I'm, I'm not using red pen anymore. Yeah, no, thank you. That's, that's too, like, traumatizing with the red. Yeah, no. No, but I feel like for me, I, I mentor like she did, right? Like, if students show interest and they want to do more, I definitely take time. I don't know he's an excellent mentor, too. Like, we, I think we both take time and we definitely learn lessons from how she treated us, right? Like, she never let us pay for things. She, again, was generous with her time. And being, both of us being like working moms, it's, time is, time is our most precious resource. So thinking of all the time that she spent with us really makes me appreciate her more. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to ask one more question. What are your final thoughts about Dr. Trask that you want to end with that you have not had a chance to mention yet? Sorry, I wasn't prepared for that one. 
<laughs> that's okay. <laughs> There's so much that's it's hard to like it's hard to narrow that's in, true. you know, yeah. narrow it to down. To just one thing, right? Because there's so many contributions that she made. Okay, well, now he's thinking, and I think I have one. And again, this is aside from like all of the awesome scholarship that she's contributed. I think for folks to realize the impact she made on the trajectory for Hawaiians and higher education. So many of us are her daughters that have gone on to do all of these things to further impact the way that other Hawaiians can participate in education. I feel like Lori is a great example too with starting Hala Kumana. To me, that's a direct outcome of having been mentored by someone like Haonani K, by mentored by Haonani K. For me, Native Hawaiian Student Services is something that came from an in, came from mentoring from Haonani K. And without those kinds of supports in our community where we're actively changing educational structures, for example, I don't think that our world would look like, it, for Hawaiians especially, I don't think we our world would look like how it is now where we're really making I feel like strides, even while under occupation, mm. we're still doing a lot of things to help our people live in this world and to succeed in this world so that they can make change for our Lahu too. That's, I think for me, that's really important for folks to know. Mahalo. I think the things that I would want to make sure to highlight that we learn from her is that she reminded us always that it's about land that our struggle for sovereignty, our struggle to maintain ourselves as a people who are undergoing an, on a, lo- a long-term illegal occupation of our nation and our lands, that it absolutely is about land. So I think she would, from that 1993 speech, right around that time, right, there's an apology resolution that Congress mm-hmm. passes and Bill Clinton's, President Bill Clinton signs that says the Hawaiian people never relinquished our sovereignty or our national lands. And still, to this day, there has been no return of our national lands, not, mm-hmm. not, a, not, not an acre to the Hawaiian people for that. And so I think she would want us to remember that we not just focus on honoring her, but what was she fighting for? She was fighting for the return of our land and sovereignty. And so that fight is not over. It's a multi-generational fight that we're going to have to keep pressing for. And she would want us to be, she would want the best way we could honor her is by carrying that struggle onward, whether or not we see a full return of the all of the Hawaiian national lands that were illegally seized from our kingdom in 1898 by the U.S. Yeah, so I think that's one thing. And then I think the other thing is there's a speech that she gave in 1982, I believe, at the at the same bandstand. But it was a speech for the Proteka Ho'olave Ohana who had gathered there and they were remembering the deaths of George Helm and Kimo Mitchell. And they were, it was a more solemn, I think, kind of occasion. But, and that, that speech is on YouTube if people want to look for it. But it in that speech, she talks about how we are the alternative, that there was a vision for Hawaii at that time that was all about development of luxury resorts and homes for settlers. And she reminded us that we are the alternative to that. And we are the alternative, meaning that we, in the connection to our ike kupuna, the restoration of our sustainable agricultural systems for producing food, for all the abundant life that our kupuna had, like we still, we still are that. Whether we're in Hawaii or we're in California or Vegas or wherever we are, like we still carry that in us. And we have to be the alternative, not only for Hawaii, right, but We also know that the entire world needs alternatives to the dominant system that is creating climate crisis, that is deepening injustices. We can be the alternative that we need, that all people need, if we live in that that richness of who our kupuna were and who we continue to be because of them. Mahalo Nui for sharing (laughs) Dr. Trask with us and 
just bringing her life to the diaspora and for those who are watching on island. I'm very appreciative for your time and your stories that you shared with us and for just bringing space to why she is such a Manawahine to like remember during this month, right? But we can't let you guys go without giving you accolades of following in the footsteps of your mentor. And I could say so many things about you all just from like what I've read or what I've looked at since I would love somebody who knows you both to give you those accolades. So these are beautiful sentiments about trust that have been shared while we celebrate her with recognition and immense gratitude for the legacy she has left with us. I am a firm believer in providing words of affirmation and giving flowers to people while they are still here with us. I grew up in Keolu Hills in Chanted Lakes area where I was lucky enough when I was lucky enough to come home to Hawaii between my father's military deployments. I went to Keolu Elementary in kindergarten and fifth grade and Kailua High School in 10th grade. One of my classmates I have stayed in touch with virtually over the years is a graduate a graduate of University of Hawaii, Manoa. She has been a vice principal of Waimanala Elementary and Intermediate School and is now the current principal of Ka'ele Pulu Elementary School. So to give you some accolades today, I welcome Dr. Sherilyn Inoy as she graces us with some sentiments and she shares about the mana that both Inoy and Kahunavai are filled with. Mahalo, Cheryl, for joining us today. Aloha. What a beautiful oh, phrase. I know. So awesome. I've been I've been listening in the background. It's cool that I was like in the studio, but I was hidden like behind the curtain. Like Visha said, or should I say Pawahi? Because when growing up, she was Visha to me. Oh, and it's just, it's talk about like worlds colliding that we grew up together. And she asked me to just share a few things. So I just want to mahalo you for letting me speak and extend my gratitude and just share like the way you speak about Dr. K. Trask is I share those same feelings of inspiration that you felt. And so my relationship to Noi, you were on my dissertation committee and I'm so grateful for the time that you spent helping me <laughs> with my research. And I had the pleasure of taking my advanced qualitative methods from Kuhunavai, so thank you for that. And I just wanted to share a little bit about those two things, the virtual flowers for you folks. So I'm now principal at Ka'elapulu Elementary School, but the journey to get here was really long because I actually started my, oh gosh, my PhD program in 2009. And I floundered for a while and I hopped around. I went from ed policy and even went to into the Puba program for a year thinking, okay, like I'm not quite getting what I, I wanted at the College of Ed until I read The Seeds We Planted. So I believe you published that in 2013, Noi, and it was right about the time that I started as vice principal at Waimanalo uh, Elementary School. And I hadn't really latched on to a topic that I thought was going to really be my passion. And reading that book was like the spark for me. That was a seed that you planted for me. And I was like, I got to do this. Like, this is this is my community. Why I'm not alone. This has to be the center of my research. And I still remember like cold emailing you, I think. And like you met me at Starbucks and like had no idea who I was. And I was like, will you be on my committee? And you said yes. And that was amazing. And I just thought you were so, I just, olu olu, I think would be the word I, I would use to describe how you, you allowed me to learn and challenge me and gave me permission as a non-Hawaiian to write about Hawaiian history and guided me through that process. And I am so grateful for that. And I also want to just say how an amazing mom you are, because I don't know if I told you that if you knew this, Visha, but her daughter, Hina, when Hina was a senior, her senior project was she put on a series of three lectures, like like workshops with different Hawaiian scholars. And 
I learned more from those lectures <laughs> than any other like history course that I took even at UH or in my K-12 experience, definitely more than anything I got in professional development in the DOE. And just the fact that a high school senior, her mom as that incredible mentor modeling that for her, and she was so courageous and professional in setting that up. And I, I learned so much from that. And I really feel like it enhanced my research. I, I, I still think about a lot of the the people that she connected us with and how it just expanded my my understanding of Hawaiian history from from that lens and how important that is in in K-12 education, especially at a DOE public school. So yeah. So thank you for planting the seed for me. I feel like I learned so much from you and I, I still use so much of that every day. Mahalo, mm-hmm. share alone. I definitely will share that with Hina. She'll be so Stoked to hear that too. Yeah. And Kahuna Vice. So I wanted to say, like, I actually dove back and I was like, gosh, I just remember feeling very challenged in your class. <laughs> like your ologies matrix. I don't know if you still do this, but I I remember like I still feel like I don't understand. <laughs> but my biggest takeaway from your class is that you really forced me to think. And I just appreciate that so much, right? That as a as an educator, as a teacher, as a mentor, how you challenge your students to really think deeply and force us to ask the tough questions and and have those difficult conversations. And that you're not afraid to like have those conversations in the class amongst the students and how sometimes it's not comfortable and we have to be put into that uncomfortable space as settlers. And I think that really shaped me too in being in this space now where I can, I can, I'm okay. Like I can acknowledge that. And I feel like that's the foundation on how I can be a supporter and an advocate and bringing other settlers along with me to know what is my role in the bigger picture and how do I support all of my students, right? Especially my students who are marginalized, right? My Native Hawaiian students and other marginalized communities. And I I think when I took your class, it was critical race theory that really emerged for me from your class. And that is what I I wrote my proposal not long after taking your class. And and that totally changed the direction of, of my methodology. And so I'm so grateful and I think the last time I actually saw Kunavai was at Mauna Kea in August 2019. And I, I just like, it's just cool that that was where I saw you and knowing that Noi was there too. So it was very special. And yeah, I just want to say I love you both. I appreciate you. I'm so grateful. And you make such a difference. So thank you. Mahalo. 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 Mahalo, everyone, for being here. And just to share Lynn as well. Yeah, yes, I was Visha growing up because most people in the States don't say Pawahi. They don't even try. So luckily in Canada, everybody can actually say Pawahi and they actually try. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good thing. I think what I would say to you is I've known you since fifth grade in different parts of our life, right? And one thing that I have always appreciated about you is that regardless of where I was, anytime I came home, especially when we were younger, it was pivotal for me to go see my friend Sherilyn down the street from Auntie Nae's house. And for me, it was it was that piece of like, home for me was the friend that I continue to have since kindergarten and fifth grade. You're an amazing mom just from what I get to see and so proud of your journey as well. So for all of you. Thank you for being here. Mahalo for all of your sentiments. Thank you for bringing yourselves and just for sharing your sentiments with about Dr. Trask and Sherilyn for your sentiments about knowing Kahuna Bai. So mahalo viewers, and we will see you next time on the Moana Nui podcast. Noi Kahuna Bai and Sherilyn, please stay tuned. Ahui ho. Ahui ho.
So many stories left to tell Even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf If they won't tell it, we will If this the land of the free, it was a freedom then When they annexed Hawaii and called it see the lands Without any type of payment and no signing off Called themselves the Republic in 1894 1.2 million acres overtaken from the native Hawaiians When they resisted, the West retaliated in violence and erasure The Hawaiian language is banned As part of colonialism's plan to expand, yeah Stuck between a rock and a hard place Multiple bombings of Kohola Bay As a part of their ongoing war with Asia Used it as a place for target practice No consent or compensation Colonizers call for annexation No work out for all the locals School will never let you know So many stories left to tell Even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf If we won't tell it, we will Too many stories left to tell Even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf If we won't tell it, we will We will So if we put Hawaii in a perspective Well, black and Asian history is interconnected Considering the fight with the Pacific then of course, versus Asia, they was treated as a middleman for war But they didn't let the western colorism run its course Cause dark skin was a sign of dignity to call The land was taken in the name of capitalism When prior to it was an actual kingdom Clap back at the system Stuck between a rock and a hard place Multiple bombings of Kohola Bay As a part of their ongoing war with Asia Used it as a place for target practice No consent or compensation Colonizers call for annexation Never work out for all the locals, school will never let you know So many stories left to tell, even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf, if we won't tell it, we will Too many stories left to tell, even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf, if we won't tell it, we will So many stories left to tell, even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf, if if he won't tell it, we will Too many stories left to tell Even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf If he won't tell it, we will We will